Good evening and welcome to tonight's In Conversation Live at the Royal Society of Medicine. My name is Professor Henrietta Bowden-Jones. I'm a trustee, newly appointed trustee of the uh, Royal Society of Medicine and also president of psychiatry. And uh, my guest tonight is Lord Michael Barclay, CBE. Before I move on to telling you about Michael, I'd just like to remind you all uh, that the Q&A function makes these interviews so very special. And I am encouraging you now to ask absolutely anything you want and within limits. And uh, I would absolutely um, enjoy hearing thoughts, memories and questions for Michael. So um, Michael, delighted to have you here. And um, uh, for, the, for everyone listening at home, uh, Michael is the eldest son of Sir Lennox Barclay, godson of Benjamin Britten composer of over 50 musical works, from chamber pieces to orchestral pieces and opera as well. He has been hosting for the past 26 years, the iconic Private Passions Radio 3 program. He was appointed CBE in 2012 for services to music, and he was made crossbench peer in 2013. Michael, welcome. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on this program tonight. And actually, well before we get started, um, I actually, as I was speaking to you earlier, I was wondering how it must feel. You've done 26 years of weekly interviews with all the great and the good in the country and now you're just sitting there in a very relaxed way uh, in your I don't know is it your home studio or your uh, anyway and I wonder how it feels to you to be on the other side. It feels very nice it's very nice to be with you um, it's uh, more relaxing in some ways uh, because you've got to keep the thing going um, uh, uh, but I, I enjoy it chatting like this it's I mean the essence of the program I think is that it's very informal and that we have the kind of conversation that you'd like to eavesdrop uh, on so it, it's not dissimilar really <laughs> Very good, very good. Thank you for that. So uh, for, uh, you know, just to let people know how we we came across each other, uh, it wasn't the first time, it was the second time, but it was the, the proper time when we spoke. Uh, we were in Oxford at the university and we were uh, both giving a talk on the same night. And of course, you will have forgotten this, but, you know, I was in great admiration, so I remember it better. So I'll remind you as well. But it sort of felt like someone had kind of aligned the planets for that evening evening because art and science really came together um, and uh, you know I, I was there just to give a small talk on art and science but you were there to, to sh with an exhibition of incredible art that you had created with Kevin, Kevin Laycock who um, is a great artist and uh, on the wall of this Oxford College uh, was a selection of the most beautiful, um, I will say harmonious uh, pieces of art, um, reminding me, initially I thought they were Japanese prints actually, it was only later when we were talking that I understood uh, the, 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 the science and the art behind them. So I will let you uh, sort of let me know, but just one thing, um, it's the first and only time in my life when I've gone to give a lecture and I got so distracted by the uh, interest and charismatic uh, speakers in the next room that I um, pretty much was walking into your talk and then someone said Henrietta you are giving a talk next door you know and I had to leave so um, I'll never forget that moment I was like oh my goodness but um, give us uh, give us a little bit of information about those pieces and by incredible chance a few years later Kevin remembered that I had been really taken by these pieces and he donated them to the National Problem Gambling Clinic and they now sit uh, in our rooms. Uh, every day I see them. So that's a beautiful ending of the story. Yes, well, it was one of those fascinating things. I've always been interested in um, aligning uh, scientific and technological endeavors to music. In fact, when I was really quite young and working at the BBC, um, in the in Kensington House, the television department, the arts program, um, I actually created uh, a piece of music and got an artist to paint the pictures that the music suggested, and then we filmed them. Um, in Kevin's case, it was even more 
um, scientifically wrought, if you like, because he used the music, he analyzed the music and fed in uh, the sequencing of the music into a computer to see what it would produce. And so um, it was both a combination of science and art, if you like, well, I hope it was art. Um, and um, I put some music together for him, sent it to him. It gave him several ideas, and then he used uh, computer-generated images uh, to create a, a film, really. But some of the pictures you were talking to, of course, started off as oils. Um, and like you, I've got one, and I'm very proud to have it, too. I think you've got an original. I've got a print, but now I know the oils are existing. I'm going to hunt them down and see what they what they look like. So you mentioned you mentioned that before the work with Kevin, uh, you had uh, worked with an artist. So hmm. what did you do exactly there then? Um, I, who was the artist? Well, he was called Rufus Potts Dawson. Um, I um, I wrote a little flute piece. And I got Douglas Whitaker, who was the principal flautist of the BBC Symphony Orchestra at the time, um, to, to it might have been in the LSO actually, but anyway, he, he played it and we recorded it. Then I gave the tape to Rufus and he created pictures um, based on what the music suggested to him, the sensibility. Um, and funnily enough, the interesting thing about that is that people often ask me, where do you start when you are commissioned to write a piece? And of course, if there's a text, there's an immediate atmosphere that is suggested. But sometimes um, when I get asked to do something, a kind of atmosphere comes to me. I, I get ideas that I want to play with. Um, and um, very often the first idea I have, I make sure that I don't lose it because um, I have lost things before. Um, I often go back to it and think actually there was something there which was enormously spontaneous came directly out of the idea uh, for this piece of music. That's very interesting. And it, it brings to mind some of the uh, past work done by people like Humphrey Ocean, who was very adventurous, a Royal Academician who ended up, um, uh, I think he was doing drawings whilst being a, in a brain scanner, if I remember correctly. I'm pretty sure it was him. Uh, but suddenly I'm thinking, well, clearly the next stage is that you, uh, you know, we, we, we play your music and we watch someone paint whilst we look at the uh, brain functions that are occurring at the same time. So we must revisit revisit that. Um, and uh, and yes, you have lost things before. I'm just remembering, I, I was doing a few bits of last minute reading and I found out at some point in your life, you lost a whole opera. And well, I lost half of it. Yes, somebody <laughs> stole it while I was un, um, unloading the car. That was pretty yeah. awful, actually. No, no, um, I know I'm laughing, but it's not not at all funny. I was, no. you know, actually, yeah. it must have been a, 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 an incredibly uh, anxiety provoking and, and tragic moment when you mm. can, you know, go both ways, can't you, as to whether you can actually recapture the creativity or not a, a bit like taking getting a manuscript taken of a novel for example something yes like exactly well it, it did prompt all the leader writers to um, dig out all of those stories about Thomas Carlyle and Lawrence of Arabia losing seven pillars of wisdom at Reading Station they were all trotted out once again so yeah, how um, irritating for you I can imagine yeah yeah. Well, it's just one of those things. But uh, uh, to go back to what you were talking about, um, uh, in the working of the brain, um, of course, one of the things that I love doing on Private Passions is talking to people, yourself included, who have great knowledge of the way the brain works and the way we process music and, and why we find it so cathartic. Um, I think it's an endlessly fascinating mm -hmm. subject. And yesterday I recorded... Um, a program with Mark Solms, um, who of course has just written a book about consciousness and and you know what what gives us consciousness. And of course, he chose a program of music that illustrated a lot of the points that he was talking about. Um, and and I get very I've always been very interested in medicine, um, partially because um, uh, when I was young, my parents had a great friend Patrick Trevor Roper who sort of pioneered cornea grafting, and he worked at the Westminster Hospital. And I used to even go and watch him operate sometimes. Oh, wow, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, and he'd put my father's guitar sonatina on uh, for my... And, and I'll tell you an extraordinary story. 
um, a few years later, well, many years later, in fact, after I went with the Lords, I was talking about Pat and how he had sort of influenced things in a way for me. And um, uh, as, as I finished, the, the minister got up, uh, was a lady, uh, and she said, well, I was fascinated to hear what you were saying about uh, Pat Trevor Roper. Um, and, you know, he wrote this book called The World Through Blunted Sight, which annoyed art critics terribly because it said that, you know, for example, El Greco was astigmatic and <laughs> he found reasons for all of these things, yeah. uh, which actually, but it did make, it was very thought provocative. It did make you look at the art again. Anyway, she said, I can absolutely attest to everything you say about Pat and how bohemian he was um, because I was his theatre sister for many years. That's incredible. What a yeah. beautiful story. One of yeah. that's just unthinkable, isn't it? Mm. And and he and how old were you when you when you went to watch him? I, I suppose I was in, you know, 18, 20. And, yeah. and then I spent some time in the Westminster because I rather unusually I got renal tuberculosis. Yeah. And as a result of that, I, as I said, I got very interested in medicine. So yeah. when I needed a part-time job try and compose in the afternoon and do a part-time job in the first part of the day. I worked at Bart's as a phlebotomist. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, it was a very good thing to do. I mean, it was as good, as good a thing to do as, for example, playing in a rock group, uh, which I did for a while, called Seeds of Discord, uh, because it taught you something very anima, elemental about human beings. Absolutely, absolutely. And I can imagine the con constant interaction with, with people as they came to see you when you were a phlebotomist uh, would have started that sort of uh, gentle chatter and making them feel comfortable that you carried on so well in, mm -hmm. In, in, in future years. But going back to Trevor, when you talked about, you know, any influence that he might have had on you, what do you, what do you carry that he somehow, there was also a generosity of spirit there. Uh, I mean, medicine has always been uh, 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 and continues to be um, a, a, a vocation. And we love, we love uh, showing people what we do. We love inviting them in to see what we do. Maybe it was easier then, a little bit easier then to sort of have people hanging around theatres. But certainly, you know, we, it is something that, you know, that doctors enjoy doing. Uh, what was it that you, left, you were left with? I think very much um, from Pat, there was uh, this element of, you know, old fashioned country doctors um, who never really believed there was much wrong with you unless you were literally on your deathbed, you know, so that there was that for him. And there was a kind of great spirit of adventure. Um, he believed uh, that if you, um, you know, if you had something you could give somebody else, then you simply should. And then I remember at one point, you know, my first wife and I were having trouble having a child, and uh, Pat, who mumbled and everything, said, uh, well, 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 I'll find a nice nurse for you at the Westminster. <laughs> so, um, you know, so even then suggesting some form of surrogacy. Oh, um, that's so lovely. And then, uh, then I must just tell you this, since it is yeah. the RSM, um, I was due... Uh, to have um, my uh, bladder and kidneys examined to see why I was getting a, a degree of um, uh, blood in, in my urine. And, but it only really came on after I'd had uh, a lot of exercise. And so Pat said, look, I'll tell you what, the medical school at the Westminster is just across there. We'll go and play squash and then you can go straight up to the theatre. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> And Are they found honest? they found behind an artery yeah. a, a, a tubercle a bacillus. Wow. So so but but isn't that beautiful? That sort of hands-on, pragmatic, but also let's just get the job done. Let's just mm. sort it out, you know. Yeah. None of these uh protocols uh that we we deal with now. That's beautiful. And certainly, you know, the world the medical world is divided into those who've been interviewed by you and those who haven't. <laughs> You don't know this, but it's actually a fact. Um, and we're all very proud to have been through. Although I was I was hearing that um, some of uh, some of us have been to your house uh, and, and some of us have been in a studio. So I think there was a time when Private Passions was more homely um, uh, than uh, than later on. Is that how, how it went? Yes, yes. Now, when we when we started, we did it in my spare bedroom at the top of the house um, and then uh, which was afforded me a kind of intimacy, if you yeah. like. And I remember 
it was quite wonderful taking Juliet Stevenson and then Joanna Lumley up, giving them a cup of tea downstairs and then saying, well, uh, come up to the spare bedroom to explore your private passions. <laughs> and uh, Joanna um, at one point said in a sort of, um, you know, uh, patsy guise, uh, ab fab, um, will we record lying down, darling? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Is that is that in one of your books? Is that written down already or, not, or, or, or for the next book that's coming? That's fine. Well, no, it's going into the one and only book, I think, that I'm writing. Yeah. <laughs> well, the one, so you have a book, but that book is just with everyone's choices. I mean, I, I have a copy of that. So that's just more... A li- you know, an enormous list of interests. Yes, I mean, that's, that's, really that's, that's, that, well, that was just to encapsulate what people yeah. have heard. Written, and yeah. it is, as yeah. you say, a series of lists. This yeah. is a book yeah. about, you know, my upbringing with, as you mentioned, Benjamin yeah. Britten and being a chorister at Westminster Cathedral, uh, moving on to composing, working mm-hmm. with people like Previn and, uh, and, then, and then the start of the programme. But what I decided to do in the book, I mean, I, I'm still hoping that it works, was to... Every time I mention a piece of music from, for example, my childhood, mm-hmm. I leap forward to somebody who used it. Um, for example, talking about Gregorian plane chant, um, Andy McNabb, the SAS writer, loves Gregorian plane chant. But it was also the choice of Richard Holmes, the biographer. And, you know, it gives one the opportunity to observe that. Uh, um, Andy McNabb can kill somebody in 13 seconds, but Richard Holmes can bring them to life in 13 seconds. It's such an incredible thing to have uh, reached as a, you know, a, a, as a plan in terms of writing the book. So are you sitting at a table with enormous lists all over, all over your, you know, how do you remember what people, I mean, I, obviously some things will be remembered, but you you must, I mean, you've interviewed so many people. Are there some special ones? I, I was going to go on to that, of course, in, in a bit in terms of the chronology of your life, but I am very interested to find out now, you know, the idea of uh, paths crossing yet again, this time through music. Um, I, I, have you uh, is it all coming out of your head or have you haven't got people helping you from the private passions team who are going hey look there's a cross reference here no no it all it's all coming out of my head it's um uh, you know I, i'm i'm just writing about i say autobi- yeah. autobiographically really and then these things um either intrude because in fact that person whoever it is chose that piece of music i'm now talking about or I, I, I aim the book sometimes deliberately towards somebody because it was such a fascinating thing. I mean, when we started, the first in the first dozen programmes, we had Jermaine Greer, Isaiah Berlin. Um, we had uh, El, um, what's he called? Uh, pop star who... Used Elvis Costello. Elvis, Elvis Costello. Elvis Costello. He yes. was your first one, I think. If yeah, I'm he was. Mistaken. Yeah. And the uh, reason we did that yeah. was that I wanted to make a statement about the fact that although this is basically people who are not professional musicians, that's hence private passions, it could embrace people who are not normally known for their love of classical music. And at that point, Elvis Costello was just beginning to get very interested in Purcell, which actually now Sting has got very interested in and Dowland as well. Very good. Well, I'm going to get on to that in a minute, and there are a few questions coming up. But I will tell you something. Um, uh, through work, I, I obviously I, I, I've done a, a, a large number of interviews with various media people, but the most surreal moment in all of the last 20 years has been uh, when you and I, you, you'd, you'd ask me something about you know, of school, and, and I was, you know, quite emotional about it. We were listening to Jerusalem, and then you looked very, very worried and alarmed, and you ended up under the table uh, in your studio, and and you said, well, would you would you help? So I ended up under the table as well, because I wasn't quite sure whether it was a medical emergency or whether... <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. And, and, and so we were scrambling underneath the table and, and I was looking for one of a little black piece that had fallen out of your ear. And, and it, when I realized it wasn't anything serious, um, we started giggling. Meanwhile, Jerusalem was blasting out on the, 
<laughs> on the program. And, um, and it was then a question of sort of recomposing oneself in time for the next question. And it was such a crazy moment. I will never forget it anyway. There you are. I just thought I'd, I'd share that with you. Yeah. Um, but uh, look, there are a few questions that I'd like to address now. So uh, I'm glad this one has happened to be the first because it talks about your experiences at Westminster Cathedral Choir School. Uh, so young, away from home. Um, how was how was it there, and uh, what did that time teach you? Well, I absolutely loved it um, because you know you were doing something as a kind of professional, almost from the age of eight. When I got there, the choir under George Malcolm was was very much um, recognised, uh, and he used this. Um, way of singing that uh, Richard Terry had pioneered, which was more forward in the mask, as we say, a slightly more nasal sound than um, uh, English uh, cathedral cooing uh, usually um, allowed. Um, and Benjamin Britten got very excited hearing this sound, so he wrote a, a Missa Brevis for us, which we recorded live, actually. Um, so it was an extraordinary um, upbringing. I, I think, you know, I've done various people in the theatre who started as choral scholars or, um, you know, I was thinking Simon Russell Beale, um, Armstrong, you know, who I mean, on, uh, that was very, very, very good. And they all say the same thing, that having that start in life gives them a certain command, a certain confidence, and of course, an ability to sing, to sing which can be you know, very useful too. Mm. Um, and uh, and you talked at some point about a sense of responsibility that started early in life for you. Um, I uh, I don't know whether that is particularly linked to uh, to being uh, uh, there or whether it was more to do with your upbringing. Um, can you remember mentioning that to me at some point in the past? Yes. Uh, well, there was another aspect to it that there was the, the being a chorister. But also at about the age of 13, my parents had a little cottage in North Norfolk. And um, I worked for the local boatman, um, who was called Jim Temple. And his son was also called Jim, so Jim Beaufort, to, to separate them. And we were best friends. And um, Jimbo um, taught me all about the channels. And when I was about 13, I was actually employed to start uh, ferrying people from Morston to Blakeney Point. And the interesting thing about this sort of psychologically is that, of course, there were times when the wind whipped up and, and you were quite worried, but you couldn't possibly show that to the um, mothers and babies and their Labradors who you were ferrying across to Blakeney Point. You had to remain totally calm and <laughs> not at all concerned, even though inside you were thinking, God, this is a bit rough. Uh, so, you know, I think that was a very good lesson um, in in how to control one's emotions and, and to appear calm, even if one's a bit worried. That's a, that's brilliant. I love that image. Um, now we've got uh, we've got Peter Sander saying uh, that he was at secondary school with John Hughes, uh, who had a brilliant voice. Did you work with him? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, he was very good. Um, I remember him well. And in fact, uh, there were a group of us. Uh, who all were trotted out to work with people like Benjamin Britten. And George Malcolm himself wrote a rather wonderful Christmas mass called Missa Ad Presepi. And of course, Lennox, my father, wrote a mass for us, a very successful one. Um, so it was wonderful. And of course, we, we loved singing uh, Victoria, um, you know, Palestrina, Bird, Talis. Uh, you know, these were all great pieces of, of music by very great composers. So to be doing that at that age is a wonderful, I often think that singing plain chant at that sort of age you, is a bit like the way Swiss and Austrian and French children learn to ski almost before they walk. Yes. You know, it gets, it gets yes. into what people wrongly probably called muscle memory. You, 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 it get, you know how to do it. And then a very funny thing happened, which was that the organist, distinguished organist called Nicholas Kiniston, um, uh, I found that my voice broke slightly early. So I was actually appointed 
assistant organist to Nicholas Kiniston. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, that he found my assistants terribly wonderful, <laughs> but it did mean that on Thursdays, uh, he would, it was men only singing and, and he would like to take uh, the time off to do some work or to go to the pub or whatever. And um, so I learned to accompany Gregorian plain chant on the organ by ear, really. Um, I mean, of course, I had the Graduale of Romanum in front of me. Um, and, and that is strangely quite a, a tricky th thing to do, to master. And I'm not a good sight reader because I can amuse myself by playing by ear. So that, there again, you know, that was a way where one was given some um, kind of uh, authority, if you like. Uh, yeah, hmm. incredible responsibility. Um, you know, I can see the movie of, of all of this, of course, with <laughs> loud music and you up there playing the organ. <laughs> when the book is written, of course, a musical, a musical book. Um, but, uh, uh, Michael, Roger Higson is a retired GP, uh, is asking a question that uh, did come to mind, actually, when I was thinking about what to chat to you about. Did Michael ever consider becoming a doctor? Um, yeah. Yes, I, I would love to have done. To be absolutely um, honest, and, and this is rather shameful, really, um, I, I was very much a late developer. And academically, um, I really hadn't got through exams and things well enough to have gone down that course. But I think more than that, I always knew I wanted to compose and would compose. I mean, from the age of six, uh, I mean, the reason I went to the um, choir school is Lennox heard me singing myself to sleep every night. I, I would go up to the top of the house where I had a little bed in an attic room, and I would try and conjure up aspects of infinity um, and I imagine what, you know, what that was like. And, and I used to sing myself to sleep. And Lennox heard me, and he thought, that's quite a serviceable voice. I'll take him to do an audition for George Malcolm. And so that's how I came uh, to do that. I mean, I, you know, I, w when I did um, phlebotomy, I, I really got as far as you can without becoming a doctor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I will say, and I'm sure there'll be many of your colleagues that will recognize this, is we yeah. did get rather better at taking blood than a lot of doctors. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm not disputing that for a second. Um, now, uh, Roger also uh, says that one of the most memorable interviews uh, he feels you ever did was with Kate Gross, who was dying of cancer. Um, it was insightful and sensitive. Uh, do you want to say a few words about that? It was a, a, a very heavy a loss. Uh, the medical profession really felt uh, the bereavement uh, when she died. And um, yeah, if you have any thoughts on Kate Gross, uh, then do, do share them. Yes, no, no, it is, I always feel it's a great privilege actually to, um, to talk to people at that point. Just occasionally we are tipped off that somebody is in a sort of uh, terminal or quasi-terminal state. And, you know, that they would be good and we should try and get them for them. It actually happened with the uh, journalist Frank Johnson too. Mm -hmm. um, with Kate, I think there was very much an element of her wanting to leave these music choices as a kind of testament for her children. So that was, um, you know, very moving to do. And she did have to stop and sip morphine, you know, during the thing. Um, I mean, I found that and other things like it quite humbling and um, uh, and it's a privilege to, yeah. to be able to go on that journey with someone. And I think it helped. I'd like to think it helped a bit to get that done. And of course, the other thing is that talking about music is so cathartic. Um, I remember talking to Adam Phillips on Private Passions and um, halfway through the programme, he said to me... Um, you know, it occurs to me that what you're doing is not unlike what I do, you know, with a client. I don't necessarily ask very direct questions. I get them to tell me stories. And in getting people to talk about music, you're doing something very similar. Um, at which point he rather clammed up. <laughs> Oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that and, and for sharing um, your, your recollections about Kate. I can see the, the legacy element. And actually, this brings a, 
uh, a memory. Uh, I, I, I once saw a patient who had said that he um, listened to your program regularly and had uh, come to see me um, uh, in the height of suicidal ideation and intent. Uh, and was only really alive because Dido's Lament had kept him going on repeat for hours and hours and hours. And he said, well, you know, um, if a psychiatrist can choose Dido's Lament, they mm. understand my suffering. Mm. And if they understand my suffering, there might be uh, a hope to keep me alive because I can't see one. And I was listening to him speak and I, you know, felt tears welling up. And of course I try, you know, I did keep it all together, but it was extremely moving. And later on, I did thank him for sharing that. And uh, thank goodness that he, you know, he's well now, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the power of music to get through to the raw emotions and, uh, and to give solace uh, yes. As, yes. as well. Um, now we've got I think to... I think actually Sorry, uh, yeah. one of, one of the things about that is that in its abstraction, music allows us to join and take from it what we will. I mean, if you're reading a great work of literature, of course you take things from it, but basically the words are telling you what's going to happen next, and uh, there's only really one way to read that. Um, it's true with a film too. Whereas with a piece of music, you can enter this sound world. And what you take from it is colored by you alone. And we all take different things from music. I find that very exciting. So for example, I can write some music, which um, you know, might be full for me of despair or happiness or whatever, but I don't need to reveal that necessarily. You know? And yet I'm always interested in what other people take from my music. And I'm always encouraging performers to be very free with it. I, I like them to take it and do something mm -hmm. um, personal. I mean, there are composers, um, uh, Ligeti, Kotar, Gravel, who are very punctilious about how they think the music should be done. But there are others who I think, uh, you see, I like the whole thing of chance. You know, a lot of medical discoveries have been made through chance. Absolutely. And, 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 and I like music that actually celebrates that in a sense. Um, you know, uh, I'm vaguely descended from Berkeley Castle, and of course it was in the grounds that Jenner discovered that if he injected cowpox um, into this unfortunate boy, not something he could do now, um, it might stop him getting smallpox. And, My and of goodness. Course it, Mm. So you are inextricably linked to our profession, Michael, from ancestral Absolutely. ancestral yeah. times. That explains yeah. it. Yeah. Um, how interesting. Yes. And and so so in the way you speak of music and interpretation, uh, uh, the human psyche being able to determine um, the direction of thought in relation to the stimuli, then then painting must go the same way then. Uh, and, and literature necessarily, you suggest, sits alongside. I, yes. don't know what, I don't know what your friend Ian McEwan would make of that, actually. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think that things like the cement garden fill people like me with delight and happiness and horrified others. So, um, so I don't know. Maybe short stories have more power because they're shorter and you don't need to conduct the reader through narrative same way and you can have ambiguity well i think you know, ian i remember when we were right working on operas and on oratorios um he said to me i've had to learn that normally um i'm the officer when i'm writing but with you um i'm a mere corporal because <laughs> <laughs> the music, he really feels the music came yeah. first yes by, yes, the, by yes. the way on the Jenna thing, can I just add, because we, I didn't say what the chance was. And of course, the chance was that he noticed that the milkmaids were not getting cowpox. Yes. And, smallpox. and so that tipped him off to say, is there something in this? Yeah. This exposure. The power of observation, exploration. Yeah. And that's yeah. why the inquisitiveness of medical minds, the ones mm. who do well, is so, is so vital. But by the way, I have to own up to 
having sat next to Ian McEwan at your 70th, a beautiful concert. Um, and I was, it doesn't happen very often, but I was so dumbstruck, I couldn't say a word to him. I just sat there behaving myself, staring straight ahead. He probably thought this woman is very, very uh, uh, you know, cold and unfriendly. But, you know, I, I think sometimes you come across such talent that you are slightly uh, in awe of that talent or you think that everything you say might be futile in relation to what they are capable of thinking. I'm sure people think that when they meet you sometimes, Michael. Do you come across people who are totally dumbstruck? Yeah, I mean, I, I know what you mean. I think people, especially, it happened even more when I used to present the proms on television, you know, because that, that has a kind of aura about it. And also people would see you in the street and they would think, you were somebody they knew, but weren't quite sure, you know, you'd see this sort of double take. Um, yes, I, I, I mean, it doesn't really happen to me that much, but um, I, I do find that uh, it's quite easy to help people break the ice if you become aware of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, again, you know, a generous, generous uh, way of bringing them into your world. Now, we've got a question from John Mason. <laughs> it's a great question. What part of the body should be most connected with music? And how might this help health? Well, I suppose this is a question about heart versus head. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I think in order to move the heart, we have to process uh, through the brain and, and also you see, I think that in music, and this is true of medicine too, there's no such thing as something that is totally original. Everything is a synthesis of our experience of things we've passed. And therefore, going through the filter of memory um, uh, is what enables uh, the heart to be disturbed. Um, so I, I, I think if I can put it that way, I don't know if that answers the question. Yes, absolutely. I like the idea of the heart being disturbed, and that that's definitely there's something there I will have to have to sort of reflect on that let's move on to Naomi Caligaro who says what are your views on music becoming part of mainstream healthcare? Royal Brompton Hospital for example have been getting positive results with teaching group singing to patients with respiratory problems should we be doing clinical trials in this area I'm really pleased that Naomi's asked this. I think this is an absolutely pivotal thing. I mean, we know uh, that music um, affects uh, children in the womb, for example. We know that Mozart helps young children. Um, I think we should be doing a lot more. And I have worked with people uh, who specialise in this. And in fact, I'm on something called an all-party political group at the Lords, which, and we, one of the things we did was to deal with um, music and how efficacious it can be um, giving people a chance. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that music does somehow get through um, in a way that other things can't. I, one of the early people I did on the program was Oliver Sacks. And he told me a story um, as an example, really, but he had a patient who simply couldn't process speech. And and one day he said to this patient, um, do up your shoes. And being the patient just looked blankly at him and being Oliver, he suddenly thought. And so he went, do up your shoes. And the man bent down and did them up. And Lovely. so, you know, it's to do with the part of the brain that processes music and speech. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I thought that was, you know, I mean, spelt it out very clearly actually but so there's a, both the physical way of connecting with people who are damaged but also the emotional way of um, allowing people to express emotion that I was on something called the Kersler Trust which put art in prisons mm. and uh, I remember we managed to get a, a guitar for a young man um, and he wrote me this letter, which was very moving. And he said, look, I can't thank you enough for this. And I really feel that if I'd had this ability to express my emotions through music uh, when I was 19, I would not now be serving life for murder. Wow. 
That's that's very, very powerful. Um, you've mentioned uh, the Lords, and although uh, in terms of any sequence whatsoever, this kind of question was going to be right at the end of the time together tonight, I do want to pick up on this because, uh, well, you and I have talked about this before, uh, there is uh, a risk at the moment and people perceive the risk being that uh, children may not be as uh, encouraged into a world of music as they might have been through the school curriculum in the past. And I, 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 I know that, you know, you feel very strongly about uh, giving people a chance and, um, and knowing uh, that at least uh, the ability for these children to exhibit their talent, to experience, if even if even the ones without talent, to just experience music. So do you want to tell us what you think is happening at the moment and, and what, for example, can happen with the support of the Lords? Well, um, I am, of course, extremely worried about the fact that uh, the provision of music in schools and peripatetic teaching outside has been so cut back and again, these things all link up. Let me give you another example. Um, we had on the program only, you know, not so long ago, Caddy Kanu Mason, who's Sheku Kanu Mason's mother and mother of all those extraordinary children. Yes. And she said, I'm really worried about what's happening in schools because, to be honest, she said, my children would not be playing these instruments now if they had been at school at this stage because the teaching is simply not there. You know, the introduction to music. Um, so I think that's very worrying. And I also think that music is sort of being, um, is encountering a double whammy. There's not just the fact that a lot of musicians fell through the government support uh, net during COVID, but there's the fact that um, whether you um, like Brexit or not, the fact is that we were told that certain things would, in terms of the trade agreements, would allow us to carry on, you know, operating within the arts, for example, and, and sciences too. Um, but what has happened is that they failed to get an arrangement um, with the EU so that musicians could tour. And they're now trying to put together a bilateral one, but it's very tricky because Spain, for example, hasn't uh, signed up. And if you are somebody who's trying to build a tour for an orchestra or even a string quartet, um, and every country has different arrangements, different visas, um, it's very hard. And, you know, if you're a young player, somebody wrote to me the other day, actually it was somebody very famous, Sarah Connolly, uh, Dame Sarah Connolly, and she said she just spent hours and days trying to fin fill in a, a visa form for Spain. And, and if you're a young player, you know, and your whole fee can disappear in terms of um, what you have to pay to do this. So, yeah. so there's another problem, but there is a reverse side to it, which is music and science is all about curiosity. I don't believe we can get anywhere. I think intelligence is based on curiosity. And so it's not just what we are not taking abroad, it's what we're not receiving here in terms of ideas. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm really, really worried uh, about that. And look, I know secretly that um, a lot of ministers actually are concerned about this, but how we change it, mm -hmm. given the reluctance to do what might be seen as a U-turn and the red lines on immigration. However, maybe the HGV drivers and the poultry workers are the opening of the door gradually. Yes, yes, I, I understand. And, um, and, and the big question is always, um, in order to preserve or reinstate the level of music in school that people would really welcome and love to see, um, will, it, uh, will it be something that will come from within um, and enforced by government, or enforced is a big word, but encouraged, or, or will it be up to philanthropic uh, donations to charities? You know, is the charitable world open to the idea of shaking things up within the educational system? Uh, is it powerful enough? Enough? Is it rich enough to do anything worthwhile, or are we really at an early stage? Well, well, it can do it, but it can only do it in small areas. For example, I went to a fundraising thing for the London Music 
Music Fund, which mm -hmm. takes children uh, on Saturday mornings to teach them. Um, but of course, that's not actually happening throughout the country. Uh, I think there are a lot of very, very generous philanthropists who are, are trying to help with this, but it does need government initiatives. There's no question about that. I mean, they have got the music hubs um, and they do some good work, but I'd like to see much more emphasis on everyone singing every morning, listening to a different piece yeah. of music at, if they have assembly, assembly. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot you can do, which doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money. I, I love that image. And of course, I, I'm rather keen on having them run a mile as well. So they could run a mile and then sing a song and then they could start studying, you know, and they'd be, you know, less obese and much happier for it. Um, so that might be a combination to, to push yeah. for. Um, I've got uh, Martin Adair saying, following on from Naomi's question, there's been evidence that some animals like cows and elephants, even dolphins, have appeared to respond or at least stand calmly and listen to music. Have you any thoughts on what is happening here? I think Martin must be telepathic because the other day uh, we've got two red bulls on the farm here. One of them's called James and is very passive and the other one is called Jaffa and is a little more, um, shall we say, excitable. And the other day he had to have his foot treated which meant being put in this machine and turned on his side uh, rather unceremoniously. And he had a kind of almost like a leather sole attached to his thing. And after he got out of this, none of the boys on the farm could get anywhere near him. And then one day I went in and Jaffa was in the barn and I sort of leant over the railings and I started to sing to him. And he got up and he made his way across to the railing and he started to sort of nuzzle me. It was quite extraordinary. I mean, I, I can, I've got a film of it, so I can prove this. Oh, you've um, got a film of yourself singing to the bull. Yeah, I've got, I've got, I, I would turned on. To, yeah. I would love to see that if you'd like to share <laughs> it with me one day. Uh, there's no awesome. question um, that, that he, <laughs> yeah. and, and I do think that animals respond. It may be the tessitura of my voice is rather like a, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, but no, I, I, I think it's a very fast, I think yeah. animals do respond quite a lot of them to music um, um th there's areas to explore there of course which i hope we we'll, can do in, in due course i look forward to hearing more about this it, it's just such a such a beautiful area to explore uh someone here is uh saying how peter sander how does bird song influence your composing well i wish i had messian's ear for writing down and notating um uh, per song, especially when we did a, a trip which was adventurous for other reasons uh, in Colombia about three years ago. Um, and we heard the most amazing bird song in the forests. Oh, I, th I think no musician can be averse to it. And, uh, you know, whether you're thinking of the pastoral symphony um, or even the kind of sort of aleatoric nature of their singing, which um, can be so fascinating, the beauty of a blackbird. Um, it, absolutely wonderful. Uh, yes, no, no. I, 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 I've, I've incorporated ideas from that into my music, and quite often, I often get ideas for music when I'm sleeping, when I'm walking. Uh, the great thing is to try and write them down before you forget them. Um, but when I'm walking, you know, apart from singing to cattle, I, I actually listen to the sounds. I got an idea for a piece of music simply from the movement of trees in the wind and the rustle that they made. Um, so I think there are so many things in nature which feed in uh, to composing. Um, uh, and and I, I think my music has become, became more expressionist. And that brings us back to the whole thing of chance too. And I remember seeing a film that Jackson Pollock um, put together his extraordinary pictures as a result of seeing the way um, uh, paint on... Um, pottery um, actually sort of blurred when it was being made and he liked the effect and so he took it to further um, extremes. Again some some sort of similarities between the processes of composition in music and art. Um, I've, we've got Syed 
uh, Rizvi asking if there's a role of music in any departments, waiting rooms or pre-anesthetic induction rooms. Well, as someone who gave birth to Angolan traditional music at my request, um, I would say absolutely, you know, it's great mm -hmm. to be able to uh, to uh, in this case, I suppose the, the you know it's not it's not personalized, so you you share together. So, what would you say to this, Michael? Oh yes, no, I think that could be wonderfully helpful, especially when you see some of the behavior in A and E which staff have to deal with. If there was sort of calming music, yeah, I think it would. We know from um, research that factory workers, uh, you know, work at a different speed when depending how the music is. Uh, set up. I, I have to tell you one rather awful story. When I was in the Westminster waiting for uh, the results of my um, TB explorations, I used to go up to the top floor to the chapel and play the organ. Now, this was just next to the operating theatres. And one day a, a surgeon came in and said to me, I can see you're having great fun, but please do not pay the dead march <laughs> so, as my patients are coming in, they're convinced that they are receiving, having just had a pre med, some sort of <laughs> uh, some oh, sort of message fantastic. from above. And then when they came out, I'd play the the wedding march. Dun, dun, ba -da -ba -ba. Oh, that's amazing. Now, now I'm going to tell you an awful story very, very qu quickly about music. We'll go on to the next question. But I, I had a, a scholarship to go to Canada and look at and, and visit these sh shooting, uh, shoot up rooms, as they used to be called then. People were given injections drugs to inject because it was safer than doing it in the street and there were cubicles and there were many many uh, drug users at in there at one time and I said well how do you how do you know you know how much how much time to leave all these people to use their you know to inject the drugs and they said well when it gets a little bit packed we put on some very fast music and they inject very quickly and they leave very quickly. If there aren't many, then we use some more classical music. <laughs> and I just thought, I can't believe this is what I'm being told. I actually had to write about it because it was so crazy. Mm. Right, Christina Mary White says, might you revisit the idea of atonement, the opera? I remember that it was sort of on hold for a while. Um, yes. Uh... I would love to, because I think it's a very operatic idea. We got into a bit of a mess on it because um, Ian felt he couldn't do it, didn't quite know how to do it. And then we got Craig Rain, who's a wonderful writer, uh, to try it. And what he came up with, I just felt, you know, you have to be very honest about these things sometimes. It just didn't really work for me. Um, but of course, the story does. I mean, it may be that one should go back and start all over again, and after a gap of some years. But I, I do think it's a it's a very operatic idea, and I would love to write another opera. The trouble is, it's on quite a big scale, and getting commissioned to write large scale operas and putting them on is stunningly expensive. And unless you know uh, you are in a position where you can say to say at the Royal Opera House, this is what I want to do, and they would like you to do it, it doesn't work. I mean, I have had um, conversations with opera houses about possible subjects. So, yeah, I can see why somebody might think that would be a great opera, and it's why I thought it would be. Yes, yes. And, and so there is, essentially, what you're saying is there is a great opera in you anyway, waiting to come out. Uh, well, that will be for other people. <laughs> well, I'm but, sure but, 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 but actually, very interested. Yes. Atonement amplifies something I've been talking about, which is because what it, that novel is about, um, and what a lot of Ian's writing about, is the misunderstood statement. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and in a way, here we have chance again. Because if somebody had heard something a different way or seen something or hadn't seen something, all their lives could have been changed. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 I think Atonement, it, it, it was one of my absolute favourite novels that year. I think it touches on humanity uh, universally. And, um, you know, that's an, a, such an accomplishment. And that's, again, why I think music can come into uh, into play in terms of the interrelationship between the book 
and your, you know, and, and the writing. Now we've got, I, I, just to let you know, we've got five minutes to go. I've got about a hundred questions. I mean, you are the godson of Benjamin Britten and have I mentioned Benjamin Britten? No, I haven't because we've been, you know, got other questions to ask you. So really we should be having two hours together but we're having such fun that I'm going to actually carry on with people who are listening, asking you questions because that's so nice for, you know, to share mm, it. Sure. So forgive me for not asking you about your godfather. I might get a question in just before the end. Um, so Mariana uh, Taverner says, hello, I'm an SHO A&E a &E at the moment, a senior house officer at the moment. Would I, uh, should I ask the very lovely consultants if we can trial playing my husband's music, John Taverner? I know many people who have been born and indeed died very comfortably to his music. Yes, I think that's a wonderful idea. John was a kind of spiritual man, you know, if ever you met one. Uh, I mean, that, that wasn't to say that he didn't have his extremely naughty side, but he was a wonderful man. And his music does have some kind of a celestial element to it. Um, and in fact, I, I wrote an anthem for the enthronement of Justin Welby, and it was very much inspired by the simplicity of John's writing. And in fact, I dedicated it to his memory. So I think that uh, John is a perfect uh, composer to listen to where you need solace, where you need a spiritual um, endorsement and, and comfort. No, I think that that would be an excellent idea. Uh, we have um, uh, Naomi uh, saying that she remembers in the year 2000 or 2001 uh, at the RSM, uh, uh, being played a video of a patient being played a particular type of music through headphones, which acted as an effective anesthetic while the patient was being surgically operated on. The president of the RSM at the time, John Walton, was sitting beside her in the RSM auditorium and was as fascinated as she was. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd just share that with people people listening. Um, do you have any comments on that? Well, I think, uh, and of course, there's a lot of people listening to this who know far more about uh, the um, scientific side of this. But I think if a part of the brain um, is distracted uh, or is concentrating on something, then other things that are going on um, don't become as important. I mean, I think if you see a needle coming towards you, you probably think this might hurt. But if actually you're concentrating on a piece of music, you might not notice the needle, or at least not focus on it so intensely. Um, I'd like to, uh, now joking aside, uh, I, I would like to ask you some sort of final thoughts on your upbringing. And it, 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 was, it was an unusual upbringing because of the incredible experiences uh, at the closeness to some of the greatest musicians. Uh, Benjamin Britten being around, your father spending time with Benjamin Britten, you know, and, and sort of this whole community that, uh, that Suffolk um, came together and, and, and presented you with at some level as your, mm. you know, as your milieu. Um, do you want to share a bit with us on that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that's why I felt in some ways I should write a book because, you know, I, I did know these extraordinary people, Stravinsky, Poulenc, Walton, Tippett, um, uh, and Ben, of course. But Ben was wonderfully encouraging to me as a young composer. He, he sort of got on better with people when they were children than when they got became adults. And I think it's partially because he was quite childlike himself. Um, he loved... Um, sort of school food he loved swimming in the north sea and all in all weathers very good tennis player junior wimbledon stan that oh, right. has always told me yeah um and he would look at my music i'm quite ashamed to think how bad it was but and he would send back a card you know saying look i think this this works very nicely but i think the horn is in the wrong octave things like that show he had listened to it um and he was the kind of godfather that I'm afraid I've never been. And he never forgot a birthday or Christmas. And, you know, uh, five pounds, ten pounds would come winging its way to me. So he was um, very, very supportive. Um, I remember one story, if I've got time to tell it. Yes, you was, have, absolutely. Which was that, um, and I think this come, this illustrates something about Britain in terms of Peter Grimes, Billy Bard which was that um, 
a group of us choristers from the cathedral were all staying at the Red House or working there. And the fair was in Albrook. And Ben said to all of us, um, go upstairs, get changed, come down, and I'll take you. And here, here's 10 bob each, which was a lot of money then. I mean, we were talking now about, what, 59, around about then. Um, and I was the youngest. And by the time I came back down, um, I had somehow lost my 10 bob hope. And I was very embarrassed. And so I said to Ben, look, I don't think I'm going to come. And he guessed what had happened. And he saved my blushes because he told all the other boys to go and get in the car. And then he put another 10 bob note in my pocket. Oh, and I thought so that was lovely. a wonderfully sort of, uh, I mean, he, he behaved very badly to um, adult friends and especially people that weren't up to the job musically. But he had this sort of, uh, he, I think it was also siding with the outcasts. Yes. You know, yes, which the maybe, operas do. Maybe there's something about the innocence of childhood, about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, by the time the adults it's too late, there was something that he was capturing in all of you that was, you know, that was, that he could relate to maybe at some level. Yes. yes um, it's, I, a, it's a really special story. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it meant a lot to me and uh, um, I'm, I'm always grateful. For him. And, I, you know, if you study his music, because his word setting is is very brilliant and, the scores sometimes look almost empty because he heard everything so precisely. There are no extraneous notes. Everything just comes off the page. Uh, I was once asked to give an opinion of whether an export license should be granted uh, for the sketches he had made, the rough score of the young person's guide. And, and as you probably all know, there's a wonderful fugue at the end of that. And I said, you must not grant uh, an, ex uh, an exercise license to this because this sketch shows that he heard the fugue straight from his head onto the page. Wow. Uh, and that's quite a formidable achievement. Yes, that's a, that's a beautiful story. Um, Michael, thank you for sharing all of this. I'm going to, we, we've got to finish now, but I'd just like to end. i tell you what I'm going to do at the weekend. I'm going to work my way through your favorite pieces of music that have come up when I was researching your life before tonight and I'm going to collect them all in a little something on my phone so I can listen to them at the weekend would you like to give us two titles so that people listening might also do that anything that you have loved that has been part of your favorite lists when you well, I think I would probably I mean I love the op first opera I did with um uh, David Malouf, which is called Baba Black Sheep. And it's about Kipling's childhood. It's about a lot of the things we've been talking about because he suffered abuse, which made him, I think, create this element of revenge in everything he then wrote, including uh, the Jungle Book. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, then something very sim simple like Listen, Listen, Oh My Child. Um, but I, there's also a clarinet concerto and an organ concerto, which are quite expressionistic. Um, and, and I think they're quite exciting in an almost Stravinsky and sexual way, you know. Thank you. That It's been such an incredible night. I just feel sorry we can't just now go and have dinner, which would be yeah. the obvious thing to do next. Well, we'll um, have to do it another time. <laughs> another time. I won't forget, Michael. You'll, you'll so, be able to say to me, um, as one, uh, the wife of a tennis playing friend said to me the other day, in front of him, actually, just to make him feel a little bit cross, she said... Uh, I, I go to sleep with you every night. I, 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 have, I suffer from insomnia. So I have you in my bed every night at five past one. <laughs> what a great way to end, the, end this conversation. Now, you can stay here while I actually say a, a couple of things to everybody. I want to thank uh, everyone who came onto this talk tonight. I want to thank the technicians, particularly Maddie, who helped me uh, just before with a, a slight computer panic. Uh, I want to encourage everybody uh, to donate to the Royal Society of Medicine. We do these events for free, but we have I've got a, a, um, a QR code, you can support us in our educational mission. I also want to remind everyone that Simon's, uh, Professor Sir Simon Wesley will be interviewing Tom Holland next week 
on the 6th, and also uh, let you know that we have an art, science and politics night that I've organised for the 6th of December on loneliness. Um, uh, no doubt music will come into it as well. So on this note, I'd like to say thank you again to Michael for being so brilliant and having entertained the nation for 26 years, plus more with your own compositions. And uh, good night to everybody. Good night.